Hi, this is Lolita Ritmanis, composer for Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Emily of Arden D one two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode four of Whelmed, season three. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey, everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in a, in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Absolutely. We'll be there. We'll be ready. That's right, ma'am. At Bow Hunter Security... We're always on point. <laughs> no, it's my pleasure. <laughs> we'll see you soon. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! So the title of this week's episode is Private Security. The release date was January 11th of 2019. The in-episode dates were August 1st. Uh, the writer was Michael Vogel. The director was Vinton Hook. Huke. We still, we're still not quite sure on that pronunciation. Feel free to come on and correct us. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. And for special guest voice credits, actually, for I think this is our first episode where we're not having really new people. It's just the regular team. D. Yeah. Ba- D Bradley Baker snores as Wolf, I think. <laughs> and that's pretty much all we've got. So, and we get Kevin Michael Richardson back as Doctor Fate. Oh but, yeah, of course. I almost consider he's just part of that. the cast. <laughs> like totally though. But other than that, it's all of our it's all of our usual people. And uh, was it Lacey? Lacey Cham- Chabert. Ch- 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 Chabert. I don't know if she's French or Chambert. <laughs> Chambert is back as uh, Satana. Our girl, well, our magic girl. <laughs> Welcome back to the studio. Can you do uh, about 20 minutes of crying for us? <laughs> uh, we're just going to need every take on crying and put that in. Okay, great. Thanks. Just All have right. that on file. I feel <laughs> exactly. like you need that on file for every character on Young Justice. <laughs> Basically. All right, let's get to this mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. So this week's episode opens with the Croc Harper household in Star City where Artemis and Will discuss an upcoming appointment that she has that she'll have to take Halo to since the displaced Metatine is now living with them post-mission. <laughs> take your take your housemate to work day. Yep. <laughs> uh, and then in Happy Harbor, we see Brion is now staying with McGann and Connor and is clearly upset about his brother's coronation back in Markovia. And over in Metropolis, we find out Jefferson has set up Dr. Helga Jace at the Luther Grand Hotel and doesn't know what to do with her now. And across all three cities, all of our heroes are wondering where the heck Dick Grayson is and why he isn't taking responsibility for his actions. (sighs) My boy, what are you doing? He's dropping the ball, Rich. He is. He's dropping the battering for sure. In our post credit scene, we see Dick Grayson showing up at Will's bow hunter security business, along with uh, Jim Harper and the original Roy Harper, to ask for some help busting a metahuman trafficking facility in the city. Will agrees to help them, but only if they help him by filling in for his absent security team for the day. Meanwhile, Artemis and Halo are visiting a local park trying not to get mowed down by people playing games on their good goggles, which I'm sure will be fine. While there, we get a flashback to the aftermath of last week's episode in Markovia, where Artemis agreed, quote-unquote, to look after Halo, since Nightwing's avoiding responsibility. Dick, (laughs) do your job. You have one job. You have one. Well, (laughs) he's got a lot of jobs, but one important job. (laughs) We find out that Halo's English has been improving, but she still doesn't remember her name and that Nightwing's running a background check to try and find her family. 
Artemis and Halo then enter a weeping willow where they encounter Dr. Fate, who does a magic scan of Halo, but can only determine that she has an old soul in a very young body. Whatever that means. (laughs) We'll talk about it later. (laughs) Before we can learn anything else, Zatanna enters for what we find out is her yearly get together with her father, as Dr. Fate allows them exactly one hour together every year. And it kills Rich and all of us. Every time. Elsewhere, Dick Grayson and the Harpers are hard at work as security for a shipment of good goggles. There's like there's like five ways you can say it, and it all sounds like a band. <laughs> yeah. Dick Grayson and the Harpers. I mean Harpers. It's like liter- it's literally like musicians. I anyway. In Metropolis, Jason Jefferson <laughs> talk about forgiveness, new starts, and feeling responsible for their kids. Even though, yes, anyway, we'll get to that. And they seem to be hitting it <laughs> off pretty well. And back in California, Will Harper realizes that Brick and his thugs have hijacked the goggle shipment and Bow Hunter Security has to pursue them to the SUV in the SUV. We then get a hilarious action-packed chase down the Pacific Coast Highway. And back in Happy Harbor, Connor is working as a mechanic, fixing someone's motorcycle and trying to teach Brian how to calm down. <laughs> Trust me, you're wound. And back in Star City, Halo has some flashbacks to her previous life as a refugee, but chooses not to tell Artemis about any of it. In fact, she lies about it. Afterwards, Zatara has to return to being Dr. Fate to keep his deal with Naboo, leaving Artemis to comfort a distraught Zatanna. And I die a little bit again. This is why we're here. This is why I'm here. That's for sure. (laughs) I'm here for all this. Yes. And then back on the Pacific Coast Highway, the multi-vehicle fight continues. (laughs) And in the middle of all of it, Will calls Nightwing out on his need for someone to fill in for Wally West and his refusal to take responsibility for his actions, reminding him that these Markovia kids need his help and that his whole team is counting on him, whether he's part of a team or not. Right. And after wrapping up the fight and handing Brick over to the police, Dick agrees to step up and make things right. And Bowhunter Security ends the night by taking down that metatrafficking lab and freeing a bunch of teenagers. Backlit by the moon, looking epic. (laughs) (laughs) Epic with a little pooch on Will, which I really like. Appreciated that. I feel seen. (laughs) Let's feel some master. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Always on point. <laughs> and I know we mentioned this in our scream something, but I still I still believe that this episode is like exactly what we needed after the previous week of everything being dark and set in the middle of the night and everyone dying <laughs> and, and death and burning. So and much death. Kidnapping so and much torture and death and kidnapping and no. occasional rebirth, but mostly a lot of death. <laughs> and then this episode is like, okay, but what if we put every single Roy Harper <laughs> in a car together with Dick Grayson and made them all wear security guard uniforms and go on an adventure? <laughs> I'm like, yes, thank you. Yeah, but but thank but you. but but hear me out. Crispin Freeman episode. <laughs> Can we get an episode where it's just Crispin Freeman talking to himself? And occasionally Jesse McCartney comes in and is like, who let this happen? You, <laughs> you did. <laughs> you did. Uh, it's so good. But aside from that, I, again, we talked about this in our Scream Something, because a lot of what we <laughs> talk about is just us talking about our Scream Something stuff, but more so now. Yes. We can finally have our TED talk about how this whole episode is about parenting. Every single plot and subplot in this episode is about parenting, and I love it, and I think that's why it works, yeah. and why you're able to balance those hilarious Pacific Coast Highway scenes with like Zatanna sobbing in the park is because all of those plots have this through line about what it means to be a parent and take responsibility and be a family, and you have that in every single one of these plots, and I really love it. It's everything from the Zatanna Zatara plotline that kills Rich and me and everyone else to Artemis and Connor both having to take on these various teenagers that they are now saddled with taking care of 
to Jefferson and Jace talking about what it means to be a parent to Will being Dad Harper to Dick Grayson and everyone else. <laughs> and Will wanting to happy he has a job he can get home for dinner with his daughter. <laughs> yeah. It's real good. It's real good. Like that's my insurance least- premiums. <laughs> It's only been seven years, and Will Harper went from ball of angsty rage teen to I need to take care of my kid and make sure my insurance is in order. I have to tell you, I never in my life felt like there would be a moment in which I related to to, to <laughs> Will Harper more than Dick Grayson. <laughs> And this episode was like, oh, look, all this. Oh, and there's the pooch. All right, there we go. I got it. All righty. Feeling you there, Will. It's so good. Yeah. It's, parenting agrees with Will Harper. It does. And it's, it's good so to happy. see. He's so happy. I love it. But what else do we got? Do you you want to talk about crying over Zatanna and Zatara? Or yeah, I do a little bit. not emotionally yeah. prepared for that? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I've watched that enough that I'm probably cried out, though that has never proved true in the past, so I don't know why I even said that. <laughs> I feel like our, our Young Justice Enhanced episodes prove that you are never cried out about <laughs> Zatanna and Zatara. Calling me out on the air, huh? Nice. <laughs> Thanks, partner. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go into this in a bit of a bit of a deep dive in our Canary Debrief about the balancing of of humor and drama. You can hear us talk about it, actually, myself and Angela Murray came on for one of our discussion sessions talking about, you know, how to incorporate and balance um, drama and, and uh, humor in your tabletop role playing games and, and in writing. This was important. And we find out later why it's kind of even extra important. We can maybe talk about that in a little crashing the mode. Not only do we get this thing where Dr. Fate, you know, scans Halo and that kind of stuff, but we hear Artemis at the beginning of the episode saying like, this may be very good for Halo as well. Might be good for her to come. Yeah. And the part that gets me, like it it gets me in general, the <laughs> whole scene, but the punch in the face is Halo at the end saying, "Oh, like we're here for this part." Like where she says to Artemis like, "Your friends here, but we're not going to be spending time with your friend. Like we're not spending time with them." And she's like, "We're not here for this part." Right. We're here. We're here to support Zatanna as she breaks down. Right. And just that the kindness that Sarah puts in Halo's voice here, the matter of fact, but somehow also so sweet and empathic. This, oh, I get it now. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's real it's good. So many layers. It's so good. But there's all these other scene, uh, things in the scene. He's got. His same clothes on. Every time he takes that helmet off, he is in the same tuxedo he was in when the whole thing happened in season one. Now, yep. obviously, he's like, you know, he's transforming into Dr. Fate and he's got that costume on, like his normal outfit on and doing that kind of stuff. But yes, he says, oh, you can only meet like one hour a year. But this just drives home to me. It's like, no, I make him be Dr. Fate 24 hours a day. Is he even sleeping? Like, does it, can his body take any of this? I mean, she touches his hair and everything's white. He's not, he's just not shaved, right? Like, he's, he's got all this going on. And it's only been, you know. Seven years. It's been seven years. So, yeah, you could be a little more haggard in seven years. But he looks like he's got a lot more years than seven weighing on him. And yeah. if he's been not sleeping, if Dr. Fate has literally just been running that body ragged 24 hours a day, there's like so much implied about what is happening here, right? Uh, and again, we can talk a little bit about yep. why I think Dr. Fate is this way under crashing the mode. But this is this is brutal, right? We've talked about it. He's a Lord of Order, not a Lord of Good. And he was yep. put on a shelf. <laughs> He's put on a shelf, literally put on a shelf for, what, 70 plus years? So he's not going to let that happen yeah. again, but he's swinging the other way. And I don't know how long Zatara can, can handle it phys- physically. So I don't know how long Zatanna can handle it. No, too. I get it. Because I don't sure. know how long until Zatanna, like, 
goes off the deep end over this. Yeah. I mean, we know that she's still, I mean, she was there at the meeting with the Justice League. And we know that she's, uh, because of uh, the uh, another episode, we know that she's been training some members. Uh, we can talk about that next episode. So we know that she's participating in everything she needs to participate in. But man, and this was the, this was the I, I don't even want to call it the subplot because there's some other things going on. And it's like a one short time framed subplot. It's just incredible. It's like 90 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's so good. It's a real good yeah. 90 seconds. When Dr. Fate shows up and he's like, where is she? <laughs> just like, God, <laughs> you're a jerk. <laughs> you're just a jerk, Dr. Fate. He's, he's, so, he's the uh, worst. He's kind he's of the, the most important worst. He's the most powerful worst. Yeah. Yeah. Then, Any, you know, uh, yeah. Santana last season, you know, kind of communed with a goddess. So, like, who knows? Well, I'd see, like, I'd like to see that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> see, see that dinner party <laughs> with Zatanna <laughs> channeling Isis. <laughs> and Zatara there is Dr. Fate and having Isis just staring Fate down, like, why are you like this? You are a terrible. Terrible person. Why are you the worst? <laughs> why are Why are you the worst? Yeah, can he even eat with that helmet on? What is he just straws? No. Like, how are you feeding him? <laughs> the worst. Anyway, I don't know how we got on. Don't of that. you know Doctor Fate is solar powered? <laughs> it's the wrong. The wrong one. It's the wrong. It's Superman, I think. Yeah, actually, he might be <laughs> super powered. Though, well, I don't want to see. I keep wanting to go off on stuff that needs to be in crashing the mode. So let's move on to the next thing. Okay. Moving on, moving on to other things. Yeah. With that, staying in the same realm of that same scene, I do really love the beginnings of like Halo and her relationship with Artemis here. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. Like, and seeing on so now that I'm thinking about it, on some level, we're getting to see Artemis as a big sister, which is yeah. so oh, that's, good because she's true. Get to have that in her life, really, because Jade just up and left, but like. Getting to see her in that role is so good. It makes my heart happy. I agree. I think it's fantastic, all of it. It is. I was going to say, there, there's something that you pointed out to me that I didn't catch uh, some subtext, in particularly the scene between Connor and Brion. Like, I'm watching it, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Connor's working on a motorcycle, and he's fixing this motorcycle, and he's kind of teaching Brion to, like, ground himself right ground yourself by doing something else and like focusing on yeah, some other things I love this scene. but it wasn't i didn't even kind of register it until the first time you told me you were like connor has become a, a man who fixes broken things right and it just was like yes, those are oh and then after the second time i watched it i think i registered more that he is being this is his job he's like i need the money and yes. this motorcycle needs yes. me Right? Like this kind of thing. Like he's building <laughs> this love. It makes my heart so happy. I know. It's so cool. And I also love when we get the fla <laughs> get the flashback. Was it the flashback? It's some yeah. But uh, there's at some point where, Con where, where Connor's he's like, like. He's kind of a rage monster. And, and it when just goes right up your alley. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, it's coming around, coming around to, to bite me in the bum. Like, okay. I guess this one's mine. Yeah. <laughs> I, and they I, do, and even this episode, they early on have that thing where <laughs> McGann's like, I didn't realize you were going to be bringing home another stray. And right. she's just like, eh, it's fine. He kind of reminds me of you when you were 16. And, right. and Connor just sighs and goes, yeah, he kind of reminds me of when I was 16, <laughs> too. It's not a good thing. <laughs> all I do is flashback to the first scene where he's all, he's all, get on board or get out of the way. I'm like, oh, hey, Brion, what's up? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, but that scene, that scene is so good as a progression of just showing how much Connor has evolved as a character in a way that makes perfect sense for him. And I mentioned the little kind of Easter egg of it back in Scream Something of if you think all the way back to season one before we found out Sphere could become a motorcycle, right. uh, there is... There are scenes of Connor taking the time to work on and fix his oh, yeah. super his other bike. His, like his, his other motorcycle. His team's yeah. motorcycle. Right. His other motorcycle. 
And like they establish that early on as just a thing. And it feels like it's just there as we need Connor to be doing something in this scene. Yeah. But then you fast forward two more seasons and you're in season three and you're like, oh, no, this is a skill Connor has. And this is something he can do. And it's something that matters to him. And that moment where he says this motorcycle needs me, you're like, oh, oh, that's that's so good. He went from a teen rage monster who literally broke everything he encountered to a man right. who finds meaning in fixing broken things like yeah. we're talking about. And that's just so heartwarming and so wonderful. And in that same scene, a little thing that I like that is outside of just talking about how wonderful Connor is as a person <laughs> is the fact that uh, Brion has some like, like just side comment where he's like, you have the coolest motorcycle in the world. Why do you need to bother with this? And as soon as he says greatest motorcycle in the world, Sphere in the background does like happy beeps, <laughs> like BB-8. She's just like, hey, that's me. Hey. I accept this compliment. <laughs> and I didn't notice it until this time through, and it made me so happy. Like, because she is, she's like a conscious being. She can register when people are talking about her. And I'm like, oh, that's really cute. <laughs> it's awesome. Yes. And then in addition to, so we've we talked about the heartbreaking moments. We've talked about some of the more humorous moments, but there's some pretty specific stuff in here. Some of my favorite lines are like, to the SUV. And he's like, <laughs> the my, my, my insurance premiums and the clipboard never lies. And he's like, the start, of, the start of a Harper family business, don't push it. Baby steps. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I'm just I'm older wants, I'm just older than the Jim. Clone family. He's all, I'm older than Jim, but I'm prettier. Right? Stuff like that. It's just so great. It's all just it's all just Crispin Freeman having to have a conversation with himself. <laughs> I, I hope uh, he I hope favorites. he was cracking up in the booth doing all these as well. <laughs> so funny. One of my favorites that has gotten me every single time I've watched this episode because like. There are some jokes that hit you the first time through, and then because you know they're coming, you're just like, Haha, whatever, move on. The one I laugh at, no matter how many times I see this episode, is when they are going down the highway, and there is just that same school bus of kids that is in oh. every season, oh, right. and they cut to these kids just screaming, and then they cut back to the SUV, where all of them are also just <laughs> screaming, and for whatever reason, the timing of that cut gets me every time I watch it's, this. It's real good. <laughs> that, and I just want to give a shout out to Dynamic Music Partners, to the composers for this series, who we have had on, and they're wonderful for that Bow Hunter security theme. Because <laughs> it also kills me every time I hear it. Every time that they, in like their security guard uniforms, have like dramatic epic pose, and those like <laughs> trumpets come in. And I'm just like, it's fine. I'm fine. I'll just laugh into eternity over here. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, Neil pointed it's at Neil. Wonderful. Neil pointed out a couple of things. A couple of times he would. There's an there's an ad on Brian's phone. I think when he's looking at the coronation, and it says Chicken Whizzies on the bottom. At first he was like, I think it's a chain, and we were like, No, it was just like an ad for Chicken Whizzies. But he says it's he's all it's totally a restaurant chain. There's a bucket and the drink cup both have. CW on them for chicken whizzies. So it's apparently a Kentucky fried chicken like chain. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, he loved another comedy line that he loved was who's going to take this stuff in broad daylight? We're taking this stuff in broad daylight. <laughs> it just set the tone. It set the tone for what this was. And, you know, we talked about this, I think. But so far, and we see this later in the rest of this first half of the season, this is, I don't think this is any kind of crash in the mode. We get all kinds of different types of shows. Like there's all kinds of different genres of comics, like that superhero movies, superhero movies are not a genre, right? Superhero movies are a vector for many genres, right? Action, horror, mystery, fantasy, magic, whatever it happens to be. In this episode, there is a tone, there is a through line of the, <laughs> the A plot of this episode that is punctuated by these dramatic moments we're talking about. But like, who says that? We're taking this stuff in broad day. Like, they didn't know that. They're parked in a car. They already, you know what I mean? Like, hilarious. Um, <laughs> the fact that this Neil and I both live in California. So I was like, wait, the Pacific Coast Highway? Are they in Los Angeles? Where are they? Are they in Los Angeles right now and going to PCH? 
because PCH is they're, PCH they're is scary. Studios. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, they're probably in that area. The production that makes sense. The production of, um, I mean, the Good World Good Goggles are apparently a worldwide thing. I imagine they're not being made at Good World Studios, but you're right. They probably have like the only reason I mention that is there is like the fence outside where they're at for the security thing. There is a quick shot that has like the Good World Studios logo on that fence. Am I remembering that correctly? The do they have the that. Warner do they have the Warner Brothers like water tower too? For some reason I I'm picking I have to go back and rewatch it. I believe it, but I don't know. <laughs> Neil also says world's strongest clipboard. <laughs> they be- they beat a brick with this clipboard. A-, a mag light gets broken. Yeah. But not the clipboard. <laughs> but the clipboard yeah. Is fine, which I just remembered this. I can't believe I didn't list this in my aster. I completely forgot to talk about this. The entire thing with uh, Will and Dick talking about Wally. Yeah, yeah. Because that's such a good moment in that bit. Do we want? Yeah. Do we want to cry about that, or can people just go listen to scream something for us to cry about that? No, go ahead. You you dive in. It's just it's a it's a good scene. It's a good dramatic scene in that hilarious plot line where we can have the world's strongest clipboard and everybody screaming in an SUV. Right. We get this moment where Will recognizes exactly why Dick put this mission together and exactly why he has to be there. Yeah. And it's just to call out Dick Grayson and go, you need to take responsibility. Yeah. Because Dick Grayson knows himself as a person and knows that he sometimes needs somebody there to tell him that. Yeah. And, Will, and it's just another great moment of will being that kind of dad harper to somebody and going okay you know what fine i will tell you what you need to do right now and what you need to do right now is take responsibility for these kids go back to your team because you need a team no matter how much you think you don't yeah and just in general step up to the plate and like once he says that and having someone vocalize the fact that dick grayson as a character kind of needs that wally west in Young Justice yeah. was so good and so interesting because like I hadn't made that connection until Will said it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense as to why Dick Grayson has been the way Dick Grayson has been these first three episodes. Yeah, I mean, even the implication, even even if we're, we're right, like he, that he left being Nightwing entirely and went to go work yeah. for, you know, do something else right just go leave yeah. nightwing and, and maybe work for spiral like in the grayson comic series or whatever and just do maybe that just thing. be freelance maybe whatever. just freelance maybe he didn't leave nightwing maybe he just went to bloodhaven to do his thing who knows but <laughs> and he says I, yeah. I don't do teams anymore right but like yeah. he needs that and i see that as yeah i like dick grayson as a solo hero but he always has people around him and it's like an aspect of what he needs to reflect back on himself about what's going on. And I think one of the coolest lines, for some reason, just the one of the coolest lines for me was was Will saying, the mission is what the mission becomes. You know that. I was yeah. like, whoa, how, way to like distill this kind of life down. Like this thing about Batman, you know, you got, yeah. you got the standard lines of like, you know, you, how you adapt, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy. How you adapt is, is how you, you know, show how good you are at what this job is, that kind of thing. But in, he's saying that, but different. Yeah. And he's saying like, like it more like there's long term yeah. consequences of what's going on. Like you're not just going, altering in the mission when you need to, and then blowing up a building probably, and then coming <laughs> back. Right. And then, but this yeah. is in the in the mission here, buddy. Sorry, it's become taking care of these people, and you are a person who is responsible. We, I know you in your heart. You want to do this. You can do this. You're a good person to do this. But you have to process through something, <laughs> and whatever that is, you need to figure it out. You know, I I I love it. And hearing you talking about it here, I just realized Dick Grayson does have that line where he says, "I don't do teams anymore." Yeah, except. This entire season, everything he's done is on a team. Yep. Dick Grayson has a has an innate need to put a team together, no matter how much he wants to pretend he doesn't. And even outside of that, we know he's been working with Oracle. Right. Like 
even when he's like, I'm a, I'm, I'm on my own. I'm a yeah. solo actor. Like, except <laughs> you've got Oracle with you the whole time. Right. So it's like, yeah, Denial I'm a much? solo actor. I'm going to go take down this <laughs> ring in Markovia, except let me go get like right. three of my friends three. and like and their motorcycle work together on this right. and <laughs> their motorcycle. I need Superboy, but can you bring Sphere? Please, that Sphere is who I'm really here for. Yeah. Connor's important too. Right. Oh, um, but. The last thing I. The, the, go ahead. Neil's notes. Yeah. Oh, no. I was just going to say the last, this thing I wanted to wrap up with was something that Neil and, yeah. I, Neil and I were both thinking of and you were probably thinking of as well. It, the, they, the whole episode is about this security firm doing a, yeah. something, some nonsense, right? <laughs> And at the end, yes. which would normally be an actual episode of superheroes doing something, they just kind of glance over like, yeah, we can take this pe- these people out. <laughs> like, there's no, there's nothing right. in the way, right? We don't need, that's not part of the story, right? Yeah. We just need to move forward. But there's all these kids that are coming out. None of them had lines. So, none of them are in the voice credits. But you can't help every time that they're freeing kids. <laughs> they're like, okay, who is this? Who are these six kids? Like... You know, are these season seven or like who are these? Like, are we going to see them at some point? Another two seasons, and then we'll be like, well, back in episode four of season three, <laughs> right. we saw character X for right. two point five seconds right. leaving a building. The only reason we know Stephanie Brown was in that group was because she had a line, and they listed yeah. her in the credits as Steph Brown. That's the only reason we know that she was in season two. So anyway, all right. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back with uh, some Canary Debrief. Ah, yeah. Uh, Welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. This week, we'd like to thank our newest patrons, Woshek Kazmarek and Katrina Kurtz. Hopefully I pronounced those correctly. Thank you so much for your support and to all of our patrons. This week, we also have a new review, a five-star review from Kyle Gould. Thanks so much, Kyle. Amazing work, amazing insight. Great fans of the material, amazingly knowledgeable about the history, and they bring to bear a joyous and joyful perspective every episode. This is must-hear audio if you're a fan of Young Justice. Thanks so much, Kyle. You can also actually hear Kyle as a guest on our show in our discussion session talking about Red Tornado. As we mentioned last time... This week, you'll be able to hear Neil on The Math of You this week. The Math of You is a podcast that explores the formative media of our youth. And tomorrow, producer Neil guests to talk about his love of Beast Wars. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process uh, from the episodes that we review. And in this episode, we nodded to it earlier. This episode is the living embodiment of what I mean by balancing drama and comedy. So if you ask any nurse, doctor, firefighter, police officer, soldier, nonstop heavy stress needs a stress-inducing outlet. If you don't get one, um, like in emergency situations... Um, that you have to just keep going all the time in real life, that outlet sometimes comes out as what's called gallows humor, which is humor being used as a defense mechanism (laughs) during hard times, even when it kind of may not feel appropriate if you were in a different situation. When writing, filmmaking, running role-playing game sessions, you sometimes need to give your audience or your players a break. This season started out heavy and powered through the first three episodes, (laughs) just nonstop ending with, you know, Halo being grabbed by Plasmus and Plasma being Plasmus being shot. Like, it was heavy, and we needed a break. Bowhunter Security reminded me that there is humor and friendship and teamwork outside of hardship and abuse and death in the show. Uh, the same as in life. We choose as writers to share our stories through a particular lens, We do that to keep an emotional and consistent through line to the ride that we're taking our audiences on, but any comedy is enhanced by a little bit of drama, and any drama can be supported or even highlighted, grounded by comedy. The conversation between Will and Dick on the top of the truck was hilarious and poignant. It gave us relief from the heavier burdens of the previous episodes while still moving the plot forward and in, in increasing character development 
of those previous episodes, all of it kept moving. And even within this largely comedic episode, we get the opposite. We get the reunion of Zatara and Zatanna, um, this deeply emotional moment that acts as a bit of a break so that the whole episode doesn't feel like just a joke. So keep an eye on your through line. It's important. But know that your story can lean pretty far to either side of that through line without changing it, its overall direction. When you do that, it will prevent sensory overload in your audience and give some relief, especially if that sensory overload is from adrenaline rushes being triggered by the action or horror or whatever it is that you're writing. All right. And with that, let's move to some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations that celebrate DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. Uh, Emily has some fan service for this week. I think I've got one for next week. She's been carrying the burden of fan service at the beginning of the season here. So this time around, I'm, I, I picked out our fan service. I found yet another Tumblr artist. <laughs> If people, people can probably guess where I'm searching stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this week we have an artist who goes by the handle Faya Arts. Faya Hearts? Yeah, is how I'm going to say that. <laughs> Figuring out how to read Tumblr handles <laughs> can be its own adventure. Absolutely. Uh, and she has done just a bunch of really, really awesome, kind of adorable portraits of different members of the Young Justice team that have just a lot of character and a lot of heart. And I think they're just they're just fun. Go check her out. We'll have a link to her blog down in down in the show notes. I when you when you first showed this to me, it felt like it was this combination of this combination of Young Justice with almost like a um the new She-Ra uh, animated series style and Steven Universe style kind of merging. Maybe no. I feel like d- not to me, but only because I see a lot of art for both of <laughs> both of those shows. Oh, and those maybe have a distinct. Those have a distinct, very well, kind of yeah, blocky, I mean, it, simple polygons thing that I don't see in this art as much. But I don't know. Huh? Why well, I got that impression? I'd have to go back and look. It's I'm not an pro- I'm not think, an art critic as much the as color palette. In some ways, oh, maybe the color palette's a little brighter and a little softer than the usual Young Justice colors. I- I'm more, e- I I'm know. more easily able to break down like a story, like in its emotional beats and arcs, than I can with art or music. I'm just, I, I'm just like, oh, I like that, and for some reason, something about it immediately like sent me to these other art styles, and I don't know why. Um, I don't know. It's all good. Who knows? Just Somebody else go out there, tell me why. Check it out. For yourself, listeners, and tell us on Twitter which other animated series it reminds you of. Right. Tell me how. Tell me how wrong I am, please. Or right. I could be right. Rich can be right. I can. I can be right. Thanks, Emily. Rich is allowed to be right. (laughs) But aside from all of that, they're just real cute. Check them out. I I like some some Miss Martian stuff that she's done. She did a real cute one of Halo. So oh, super cute one. With spoiler Halo. alert: If you don't know what Halo's design looks like later in the season, that is the first one on her page. If you don't want to see that yet, if you're watching along with us and want to be surprised by what Halo ends up looking like, then don't click her uh, <laughs> blog. But if you don't care, then go look at this cute art. <laughs> probably, probably already seen it. Maybe. Likely, Maybe. probably. It's in, you know, it's in the promo. This is like a, gr- this this series, is like a but... great lead in to Crashing the Mode. Let's, oh, let's do that. Is it? Yeah, what a good transition <laughs> right into some Crashing the Mode. Let's do it. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. <laughs> Our earlier segments assume uh, listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy and tin hats. These spoilers will be based on only the first uh, 13 episodes, as that's all we've seen as of this recording. So if you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. 
Every episode has just got so much stuff going on. So what do we want to start with? We want to start with Halo, since sure. we led with that. Halo that up. So, <laughs> Halo that up. Okay. Uh, it's a verb now. Uh, but we have, in this episode, we have Dr. Fate mentioning that Halo is an old soul in a very young body. And we all went, huh, that's weird. I guess it's connected to the whole ancient alien thing from the comics. Right. It's because she's a mother box. <laughs> I feel like every Crashing the Mode episode, we're just going to go, by the way, Halo's it's a, a mother, mother box, box until right. it gets revealed <laughs> on the show. Yeah. But we still don't know why she is choosing. I don't know. Is she denying the previous life? She's fighting so hard in so many of these episodes to say like, no, that person's gone. I'm this person yeah. now. And she, even when she has these memories, she's just like denying this previous life of Gabrielle Dow. I do think it's interesting, though, watching it again, what she says to Artemis when she asks, she's like, do you remember anything? Her response is nothing. Only darkness. Yeah, I only darkness she doesn't or even, something. Yeah. And it's like, on some level, on some level, she's telling the truth because, yeah, <laughs> everything we see of, of Gabrielle Dow's previous life is pretty awful. It's true, Obi-Wan Kenobi. What I said was true from a certain point of view. Yes, that is technically true. But, uh, but yes, Halo is yes. lying. She's lying. Uh, I think it is related to what that conversation they have later in the series about her being like, I'm not that person anymore. Yes. But why? I mean, I don't know. We could go through. I I think we need to get Dr. Letta Mendy back on to talk about the psychology of Halo. Let's do it. Can you explain the psychology of this (laughs) non-human, non- Yeah. Non-alien, just kind of a strange (laughs) sentient energy source. Can you explain her psychology? hear me out. (laughs) Ancient alien in a young body. Go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ancient non-humanoid alien. Like, because that's part of it. Like, Halo doesn't know how to be a person. I mean, she has, the, Dr. Letta Many has this whole podcast where she talks about the psychology behind Killer Croc. I think she can handle <laughs> a mother box. I don't know. The whole thing I was nodding at with Dr. Fate <laughs> earlier. So, we find out in three more episodes that Naboo Soon. was one of the sons, one of the children of Vandal Savage. <laughs> this is just bonkers. And in a scene that is not discussed or mentioned in the episode, yep. it's just shown, referenced, and then they move on and right. leave us screaming. Right. So we see a shot with this his son with the, with the helmet of fate on. And then it's like, and then his son Naboo died. And you're like, his son, oh, what? His son, what was his, his name? Son who now? <laughs> who, how, who? His son, what now? Who? We'll rewind what? that. Why? What? How? <laughs> yes. And I'm Excuse like, uh, me? my brain. Um, so, yeah, he's the son of, son of Vandal Savage. And if we have some implications of what being raised by someone like Vandal Savage, who has millennia long plans, is, it's that he is a Lord of Order. Now, maybe after he died, he was chosen as a Lord of Order because of his already, you know, potential order-like leanings by the universe or whatever. Um, or if he had, as a metahuman, he, that was his metahuman abilities, then one of the first people who could tap into magic. I don't know, but that's the case. So when we're talking about, you know, him being the most powerful worst, like, this is what we're talking about, where his lineage is coming from and... You know, not to mention that he's just been in a helmet for millennia. Like, I'm a helmet now. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, what does yeah. that do to your Probably psyche? Good to anybody. Yeah, for sure. I'm making up for lost time. Forget you people. Yeah. So that's intense. And I'm hoping we either get more in the back half of the season or we get more in the next season. It'd be fantastic. You want to talk about Jace and Jefferson? I will. I just have to say that you said like Dr. Face being like I'm make- making up for lost time and my brain was me like Dr. Fate goes out clubbing. It's got the outfit for it. <laughs> but. <laughs> oh man, our lights aren't working. Leave it to fate. <laughs> <laughs> just the giant. Oonce, onk oonce, appears oonce, in the oonce, 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 oonce. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Disco ball. It's T chain. <laughs> Dr. Fate's a great DJ <laughs> name. Have- we, it is, but we have gone so far off the rails. Uh, so our other crashing the moat stuff, real quick. We've got these good goggles that will prove to be just as ominous as they appear. They're not good. They will not be good later. 
So there's too much to unpack there, but they're just not good. Um, uh, they're not good. And we've also got, in this episode, we have the first little inclination of what's up with, with Jason Jefferson, which first time through that scene between the two of them, my brain went, oh, they're ending up together by the end of this season. But I, I didn't even mention it in our scream something because I went, oh, I'm crazy. This is just me talking. This is just Emily Shipper brain talking. But, you know, give it like three more episodes and they're going out on a date and going back to her t- hotel room. So, you know, I was right. <laughs> I just didn't mention it. Hotel room 1616. <laughs> the only, yep. only hotel room in all... Luther Grand Chains, apparently, because it comes back after that in a whole different one. Yeah. But we also have that scene with her now that we're now that we're super sp- suspicious of Jace. Yeah. Her scene where she's like, yeah, no, I just I feel kind of I feel kind of parental towards these two kids. I feel responsible for them. And I'm like, ah, screaming forever about her and them and that whole implication because we do know that she has a daughter somewhere in the world. And she doesn't mention that to Jefferson, which is interesting, looking back on it. Yes. But I think that is all of our crashing the mode for today. I think so, too. We got some more stuff next episode. Uh, so I agree with Don't you. With, with that, we can say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a lot harder to find those, so please make it easy on us. We want to we wanna give you some credit for saying nice things about us. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 